Hi, my name is Ricky Moreno and I'm the nurse for Berkeley Unified School District. I'm here today to talk to you about type 1 diabetes and the care of students specifically at the high school. So today what we're going to do is establish a basic understanding of diabetes, the components of diabetes care at school, symptoms and treatment of high and low blood sugars, emergency treatment for low blood sugars, and practical implications for educators. So why do we need to know about diabetes at school? Student safety, right? This is, a, this is a chronic illness when well managed, students do very well, but when they're out of range and not doing so well, it can be quite dangerous very quickly. Uncontrolled blood glucose impacts both short and long term academic performance. And what we all know is that when we haven't eaten a little bit, we haven't eaten for a while and we try and do something that sometimes we don't think so clearly. It's the same for these students except for the fact that they really do need to have that, that blood glucose in their bodies in order to be able to perform academically. Students with diabetes are entitled to accommodations in order to, be, to fully access their education and that is part of the American Disabilities Act um, 504. Basic accommodations. So in all of these students 504 plans, there are basic accommodations that are listed. And those basic accommodations are free access to water, free access to snacks, free access to the restroom, free access to blood glucose testing, wherever the student is most comfortable. And that is really critical. We actually see much better compliance rates with students taking care of their diabetes if they are able to test wherever they need to. And lastly, students need to check their blood glucose before all exams. And what we've actually asked students to do is to check before exams and to write their, their blood glucose number at the top of their test, and then to get back into range before they actually start an exam. So anytime, any place monitoring. As I said, we can actually improve student compliance, student health, student functioning around their diabetes with, with the room for them to actually test their blood sugars whenever they need to, wherever they need to. So for students who can self-check, which is all of our students at the high school, um, they, we get better blood glucose, glucose control, it's safer for the student, the student gains independence, there's less stigma, less time out of class, and it assists in decision-making in response to the results. So students are actually able to do something about an out-of-range blood glucose pretty quickly if they're able to test wherever they're comfortable. So what is diabetes? So diabetes is a chronic disease in which the body does not make or properly use insulin. Insulin is a hormone that is needed to convert sugar, starches, and other food into energy by moving them from blood, the blood into the cells. Type 1 diabetics require daily insulin replacement. And most of our students, although there are a few who are still doing injections, most of our students have an insulin pump that is slowly giving them insulin all the time, 24 hours a day. Symptoms of type 1 diabetes. So for students who may be out of range or for newly diagnosed students, we see frequent urination, excessive thirst, extreme hunger, weight loss, irritability, weakness and fatigue, and nausea and vomiting. And the key in this is really to get to know your students when they're sort of at their baseline and their best so that you can look at them and go, huh, you know, he doesn't look like he's feeling quite right today. I wonder if, he, I wonder if, his, if his blood sugar's off. And it's okay for us. We have the right to tap somebody on the shoulder and say, you know what, I think you probably should check your blood glucose. Something doesn't seem quite right. And oftentimes we're, we're right on. Issues in diabetes that require immediate attention. So we look at diabetes, we look at blood glucose and we look at two things. We look at hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, and we look at hyperglycemia, high blood sugar. And for most of our students, that's, that's anything, for low, it's anything lower than 80, and for high, it's anything greater, actually, although the range is 80 to 120, greater than 250. Hyperglycemia. Oftentimes this is caused by too little insulin, so they ate far more than they had planned on eating and they didn't give themselves enough insulin to cover it. Illness, infection, or injury, stress, so taking a test, and that's why we encourage students to test before they, um, they take an exam to make sure that they're not so stressed that their blood glucose is really high, and decreased activity. So hyperglycemia, you can see that there's a wide range of symptoms. Hyperglycemia, while serious, there are more long-term effects from hyperglycemia. It's not an immediate response, and it's not an immediate emergency, but over the lifetime of a diabetic, there's a lot of damage that can be done. Um, and, and this PowerPoint will be provided to you as well, and you can look at these symptoms a little closer. So treatment for somebody who's high, we want to get that blood sugar down at, at, into their target range as quickly as possible. Insulin, which is going to bring their blood sugar down, 
access to water, because water is actually how we can flush um, blood glucose from our bodies, access to the bathroom, access to the health center. So all of these things can be done. You, you're, you're lucky in that you have a nurse on site. If a student's not feeling well, they should go to the health center and the nurse can work with them to get their blood sugar back into range. And then rechecking their blood sugar to make sure that they're back into range. Um, and if they're not going in the direction they need to be going in, then calling parents. So hypoglycemia is a little bit more serious. Kids really do compensate very well. And so what we know is that kids will do really well for a while and then all of a sudden they're not doing so well. And with hypoglycemia, it can become very serious and life-threatening. So um, causes are too much insulin. So now the student planned on eating a whole sandwich and gave himself enough insulin for, to cover that sandwich and he only ate two bites. So now he's got a, a, a lower blood sugar. Um, too little food or delayed meal or snack extra unanticipated physical activity. So for our PE teachers, it's really critical to know that these students do, um, that, that um, diabetes is impacted by physical activity. So the more physically active you are, the more you burn blood, sugar, blood glucose. And so that can actually put you at risk of having low blood sugar. So it's important that students, before they're very physically active, sort of dose up with a little bit extra blood glucose, or with a little extra sugar. Um, illness, medications, and then again, stress. So it can be at the other end as well. Stress can also cause low blood sugar. Again, low blood sugar symptoms, we've got some mild symptoms, you know, hunger, sleepiness, shakiness. But as we go into the moderate and severe symptoms, that's where things get a little bit more serious. Students become more confused, more irritable. Um, they may have emotional lability, all of a sudden sort of crying. So again, kids that look very different from their stereotypical baseline in your classroom. And then we go into the more dangerous area of having seizures and being unconscious. So prevention, so for hypoglycemia, what I say is when in doubt, test. And that's why I said to you earlier in this presentation, if you're feeling like a student's just not feeling right and they're a student who has diabetes, it's really okay to say, hey, you know what, I really think it might, you might wanna go ahead and check your blood glucose just to see how you're doing. Because it's better to test and find out that everything's okay than to not test and have a student who's becoming lower and lower. Um, students should always have a quick acting sugar source with them. It's okay to ask them if they have that with them. The health center on your site does have extra though. Always treat the onset of symptoms and if you have any doubt at all, call the health center and have the nurse come on over. Um, and know that the nurse is also available by radio. So mild to moderate hypoglycemia treatment. Intervene promptly. We want to check their blood sugar if you can with the meter and I'll show you that in just a little bit. Um, and have the, the student eat or drink something that has some fast acting carbs. And what we say is something called a rule of 15. A 15 gram carb snack, you wait 15 minutes and then you check again. You never send the student anywhere by themselves and you never leave them alone during this time. Again, really important time to incorporate that nurse because that nurse can work with the student to get them back to a stable place. Um, and when in doubt, always treat. So if you have a student who's with you and they're a diabetic, and they're not feeling well and they're feeling a little lightheaded and they don't have a glucometer, they can't check their blood glucose, better to go ahead and give them some sugar than to not. So as I said before, the rule of 15, 15, they should eat or drink a 15 gram carb snack, check their sugar again in 15 minutes and repeat the symptoms until their, their sugar is back into, their blood glucose is back into range. And if the symptoms continue, call the nurse or parent guardian. I actually would strongly encourage you to go ahead and call the nurse at the onset of this issue. Um, so after a mild, moderate episode of hypoglycemia, make sure that the glucose is returned back to that target range. And here's the really critical thing. So a student will be low and they get back into range, and then what happens? They're not gonna eat for another two hours. Well, the likelihood that they're gonna get low again is actually pretty high. So if we know that there's not a meal or a snack planned uh, for, for more than 30 minutes, then we want them to go ahead and have another, another snack to sort of boost them up. If we know that they're gonna eat again soon, then it's okay to stop there. Again, incorporate your nurse into, these, into this activity. So severe hypoglycemia. So hypoglycemia is considered mild to moderate until the student becomes unconscious. And we hope to never go there. If indeed a student becomes unconscious and is starting to cease, you can no longer put anything in their mouth. And what's the, the most important number one treatment for hypoglycemia when a person is still alert is actually to put something in their mouth. So the basics of CPR say that you never ever put something in somebody's mouth when they're, when they're no longer alert. So you want to have somebody call 911 and the nurse and the parents. Um, make sure that that nurse on your site is aware of what's going on and is there. Place the student on their side and administer glucagon. And again, I'll show you what glucagon is in just a moment. 
Never attempt to put anything in somebody's mouth once they are unconscious. The student should respond, but it, it, no matter what, a glucagon injection is, a, um, is an automatic 911 call and an automatic ambulance ride. The other thing that's really critical to, to, to let you know is that if you know that you are not somebody who's comfortable giving somebody a shot, then it's really important for you to know who around you in classrooms is somebody who you can ally with to make sure that the student is cared for. All of our diabetics should be able to have individuals on site who can care for them um, in case there, there is an emergency. Next slide. So glucagon. So to, typically glucagon comes in a case just like this. Um, it's bright red though, so this is an older one, I apologize. It's a bright red case, just this shape. Um, inside the case, there is a sy syringe and medication. So glucagon is not stable um, if it's not reconstituted. So it's critical that you take a breath before you do this and you administer it correctly because the only way for it to actually be efficient is for, um, for you to do it correctly. Um, and so the thing to know too is I'm going to walk through how to reconstitute this, but know that the directions are also in the top of the package. So you don't have to worry about remembering this today or remembering this when you're really stressed. But what we do need to remember is that the directions are right there for you. Um, so in order to, to reconstitute the medication, what you're going to do is you're going to take the vial of medicine and the syringe and the syringe is already filled with all the liquid you need. You're going to take the cap off the medication, and now there's a little rubber stopper in the top. You're going to take the cap off of the syringe, and now you've got a very sharp needle. So take your time and, and do this carefully. Put the needle into the top of the, the stopper, and push all the medication, all the, all the liquid into the medication. Literally, by the time you push the liquid into this bottle, it's going to have reconstituted. So you don't have to do any shaking, you don't have to do any separating, you just need to get the liquid in. And then you're going to flip it over, and you're going to draw it out. So all the myths about injecting air and pulmonary embolisms and killing somebody with air from a syringe don't apply in this case because you're going to put this into a muscle. You're going to draw all of the medication out, being very cautious to slide the needle down as you go. And then once you're done, you're going to take that needle out of the bottle. I'm going to recap this so that I don't poke myself. What you're going to do for this student is you're going to inject this directly into the top of their thigh. You're going for that big thigh muscle. And I won't demonstrate that on camera, but you're just going to go directly for that thigh muscle and you're gonna and you're gonna push the medication in and then just rub it. I guarantee you that by the time you've done all of this, the paramedics are gonna be here. They're really pretty quick. Go ahead to the next one. So that's sort of the basics of diabetes as far as in administration of medication and that kind of thing. I want to talk a little bit about sort of the implication for educators. Why are we talking about diabetes in the educational setting? So students with hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia often do not concentrate well. I will guarantee you that they don't concentrate well. And what they say is that 50% of the time, 50% of kids know when they're high or low. So the rest of the time, they don't realize that they're, that they're high or low. They don't do anything about it, but they're still not concentrating well. So we want to eliminate barriers to snacks. We want to, make, we want to eliminate barriers to making sure that they have access to snacks, that they're able to check their blood sugar, that they're able to go to, the water, to get water and go to the bathroom. It is critical that not only you as their teacher, but for subs or anybody else who's working with them, that those folks are informed about the basic rights that these students have in order to access their, their education. Uh, make sure you have diabetes sub sheet. Have an emergency earthquake plan. So what's your plan if there's an earthquake or a disaster on site? knowing fully that you do have a nurse on site, which makes, you know, makes it a little bit easier. Field trips, always bring snacks. Plan ahead, consult with parents. I realize fully that our kids in high school um, are almost adults, and the truth is, is that diabetes is very hard to handle, and for our almost adult students, thinking about a field trip is about thinking about how fun it's gonna be and not necessarily about planning and taking care of their diabetes. 
bring diabetes supplies, including low box emergency equipment and emergency contact information. So what's important for you is to bring that emergency contact information. And it's also important to make sure that you've checked with your student to make sure that they have a glucometer, that they have glucagon, that they've got emergency medication, that they've got an extra source of sugar, and that they're able and that they've got information on, on who their doctors are and that kind of thing in case in case you get into any kind of an emergency. Activity and diabetes. I talked about this a little bit before for PE teachers and for anybody else doing any physical activities. Um, everyone benefits from physical activity. Students with diabetes should fully participate. In general, activity lowers blood glucose levels. Ultimately, we know that for all of us that that's really very healthy. Um, a quick acting source of, blood glu of glucose, their glucometer, and water should always be available. So they need to have water, they need to have um, some sort of sugar source, and they need to have their meter so that they can check their blood glucose. PE teachers and coaches must be familiar with the symptoms of both high and low blood glucose. Students with pumps should supplement with a snack before an activity. And so for a lot of our students, what we suggest is that if they know they're going to have PE, that they actually have a snack before they start so that they're covered. And we encourage that. So equipment. So we talked a little bit about glucagon. And I have, as well, a pump here, or a glucometer here. And what I would say to you is this. Talk to your students. Ask them to show you their equipment. It's really important that they know that you know and that you're there to support them. And the ways in which you can support them are by making sure that, that you are aware of what equipment they have. Um, pump, you can ask a student to show them your, their pump. It's usually like a pager sitting on their hip and, and there's a little um, tube coming off of it. An insulin pen. Um, we have some students who use those, not very many anymore, syringes are the same, and then um, base insulin. Your nurse at the high school has extra supplies for a student if their pump isn't working and that kind of thing. We would not at any time expect you to be administering medications in that way. So we talked a little bit about how to be prepared for a stub, and my big question always to you guys is, where's the glucagon? Does your student have it? Is it, is it in the health center, it's a really critical question to ask your student so that you know where, they, where, where your equipment is in case of an emergency. I believe, so for more information, this is, you know, this is more generalized information, the American Diabetes Association and the National Diabetes Education Program at the NIH. Um, but I'm also the person you can contact. So again, my name is Ricky Moreno. My email address is R-I-K-K-I-M-O-R-E-N-O -E at berkeley.net and my phone number is 644-6960. Please feel free to contact me with any questions at any time. All of your diabetics with all of your diabetics at the high school should have 504s, and if they don't for some reason, it's really critical that you get a hold of me and I can sort of make sure that we're taking care of that here.